Welcome. Thanks for coming to the lab from the lab to the battlefield, maximizing defense innovation. The question we want to answer is how are we from both government spending and entrepreneurial spirit maintaining our edge in the uh, world of modern warfare? Uh, since Garrett did such, I think, a pretty good job of letting the audience know who you are, maybe we'll just dispense with that and we'll go right into it. Uh, Part of what we want to uh, cover today is the impediment to the Department of Defense ability to actually do business with commercial innovators. Let's talk about the effects on that equals ecosystem for maybe some of the more vulnerable companies. Linda. Thank you, Pesha. First of all, I just wanted to have the typical caveat that while I'm with the Department of Defense, these views are my own. I'm not speaking for the Department of Defense or the US government. Um, and um, I, this is such a great opportunity to to, um, to be here and um, remember Lincoln, who of course was the first president, the only president um, who um, owned a patent um, for a boat that goes over shoals. Um, uh, he was a, um, he created a prototype, but he never marketed it. But um, he had a lifelong interest in innovation. Um, and uh, so it was his perfect perfect opportunity yeah. to talk about uh, defense tech. I mean, I think one of the major problems in getting DOD funding, of which there is funding out there, is the time it takes to get to the to get to the source that required. Um, as I'm sure you all know, ideas are quick. They need to be funded quickly um, out in the valley and elsewhere in the innovation ecosystem. And unless they get their money quickly, they fall apart. And so um, when we, when they are, they have knocks on the door from China um, offering easy cash, um, it takes a lot more effort to come to Washington and ask DOD for money, which could take a year or two to arrive. So I would think that's one of the biggest impediments. Pablo? Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, Going to copy my, my, my good friend Linda. Um, I, I'm of counsel at the law firm of Squat Patton Boggs. I also serve as the general counsel and, uh, and legislative director for the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, although the opinions that I express are my own. Um, the, the, the issue that we're talking about, and that is the, 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 the need for the Department of Defense to have continuing access to commercially developed technology, in my view, I, I tend to describe it as one of the most significant national security problems about which folks are speaking the least about, at least in, outside the Beltway. It's an incredibly important issue, and so the, the discussion about impediments to the ability of the DUD to have access to commercial innovators becomes obviously equal, is, is equally salient. Um, I also think that one of the, one of, one of the, one of the uh, uh, primary uh, impediments uh, is funding. I, I, and in particular, I, I describe it a little bit, a little bit differently than, than Linda. The, um, the uh, what I mean is the budget process generally. Um, the, uh, the, the, the preponderance of funding for DOD programs um, is laid into over a five-year period. Um, in the future year's defense plan. Um, there is a process, a POM process, a pro process by which um, um, decisions are ultimately made on, on, on how um, uh, taxpayer money should be used to fund those priorities, and those are obviously reflected in, in, in a budget proposals that are sent over to Congress and subject to decisions to authorize and appropriate them. We, we, that process is just so rigid. How does a company that's developing a particularly promising AI application angle into that? Um, and angle into it in a way that results in some sort of sustained effort to integrate that capability into what the DoD does. I, and I don't even mean ma major weapon systems. I mean, uh, you know, business systems, uh, you know, uh, 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 systems supporting back office functions. Um, unless that question is adequately addressed, the a uh, lot of the programmatic decisions that relate to emerging technology, including but not limited to artificial intelligence, will be kind of science experiments. They'll never rise to a level kind of beyond that. Um, uh, the uh, Project Maven and other programmers of record that that turn on emerging uh, technological capability uh, right now are at grand exceptions to the rule. Um, um, right now, you know, we've got. Uh, contracting um, vehicles called other transactions agreements that are specifically
typically uh, that are particularly suitable for interacting with emerging te technological innovators. But uh, um, um, you know that that'll be that that will help the DoD work with them to develop these technologies once they emerge from development and get into actual procure, uh, production. At least under the current re regime, you have you have to go back to the the, the federal acquisition regulations, which is tends to be overly cumbersome for commercial uh, commercial suppliers. So um, I think that is probably the budget process is probably a significant structural impediment far more daunting than that, and we'll probably get back back to this uh, throughout today's discussion, are, are cultural impediments, an, a, a premium on capital expenditure, um, risk aversion within the department, um, things like that. So, but we'll, we'll probably talk about that uh, shortly. So, is my, my preliminary thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, can you guys hear me? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad Linda and uh, Pablo kind of brought up the funding issue as the primary issue because you tend not to hear that, but I strongly agree with them. And I'll take a slightly different approach to, to saying exactly, I think, what they were trying to. So the science and technology, which um, is, tends to be funded out of the research and development on the earlier phases, they kind of, to get a program approved, it's slightly different than something that's going through a program of record where you're going through full-scale development, eventual production, uh, operations and support. So. When we talk the science and technology, that's uh, the budget that's actually allocated specifically to science and technology is really less than 30 percent of the R&D budget, and even less than five percent of of the of the acquisition total acquisition costs. So they tend to be able to, you know, using the other transactions, they can get some of these smaller suppliers on, but then scaling the suppliers is really a challenge. Um, so think about if you have a successful experiment in DARPA or one of the research labs, and now you're ready, hey, this, I want to prove this out in a full, full uh, prototype or even go straight into full-scale development, right? Um, it's going to take two years for you to get that budget justified, get the, line, the funding lined up, because you need two years ahead for the programming aspect, and, which leaves one more year for the budgeting aspect of that of the, of the uh, budget that goes into the appropriation. And so you have to justify something two years ahead of time when it gets appropriated after you go through multiple layers. Uh, one of the DOD reports said there's at least 50 offices in each major review that you, that, and each one of them can potentially veto you. Uh, you have two years there, and if you're a small supplier, uh, you don't have the capital to kind of be going after all this overhead, the marketing, and other types of requirements generation that support getting you yourself into the program of record where the real dollars are going to be starting to fall. Uh, so that two-year gap is, 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 quite a, is, is quite difficult for a lot of firms to kind of get over if you don't have the, the big overhead base. Um, now, then one of the issues that you also have when you kind of program these budgets is that the expenditure profiles can go over several years. So you have a few years to obligate, and then the contractors might expend those dollars for many, many years, right? So you come out of an experiment, and then you say, I want to start. I'm not exactly sure what this thing is, but I have to articulate it. I have to, before milestone A, and I can kind of go through my prototyping and full-scale development, I'm supposed to have a fully costed plan. And that would, and at least by milestone B, when I get into full-scale development, that's going to be what my management is. Uh, uh, tethered to, I'm being, uh, I'm I'm being uh, measured for my performance based on what I said before the technology was even really there to say exactly what this thing should cost and how it should look like in the end after I got through tests. So that's one of the the big issues with with funding. It takes a long time to get it there. A lot of companies can't uh, afford that overhead. And then once you kind of get that appropriation, if you You've gotten the bureaucracy to give you a consensus. Now you're locked in for 5, 10, 20 years uh, until, until that program comes to fruition. And it's very hard to reprogram that and, and change direction midway. 
I could just make one other point to another way of thinking about this structural impediment that we're talking about in terms of the budget process is to think about well how could we address it like what sorts of things could be put in place to help to help uh, the the uh, the DU, uh, commercial innovators kind of obviate that, that that impediment. You almost need I don't want to say slush fund but some sort of ra you know a rapid innovation fund that's made available to program program executive officers or P uh, program managers that can allow them to fail fast in connection with their procurement decisions with regard to emerging technology. And you need to structure it in a way that actually incentivizes them to, to actually use it. You almost have to have like, um, uh, I'm, you know, just kind of having thought about, about this for a while, you almost need to have, you know, uh, their fit rep, you know, the fitness reports almost reflect the, you are going to be credited for you are having obligated monies for R&D using emerging technologies in, con I would say, in consultation with USD R&E or someone there. But it has to actually be incentivized because otherwise that risk aversion tends to kick in. They'll revert to, to preferred supplier networks and so forth and so on. Um, but it, it, so, like, uh, you know, I, I offer that only to suggest another way of thinking about another way of thinking about it, of thinking about this structural impediment is thinking about structural ways to overcome it to kind of uh, illuminate the problem, the, the, this particular problem. Of course, you know, Pablo, you and I have discussed this, and um, I'm sort of in sideline preparing a legislative proposal in this line. But um, the problem, I, when I was general counsel at a DIU, um, then it was DIUX out in um, Silicon Valley, was we would work with a DOD component who would say, I love that tech. I need that tech, but when I wrote my budget, when I palmed for, when I did my palm three years ago, I didn't know I was going to see what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. And so you're 100% right. I feel like that is, you know, Secretary Carter was uh, was um, visionary in cracking the code out in Silicon Valley of. Uh, demystifying DOD to the valley, of demystifying the valley to the components. But the last piece of that puzzle has to be the budget cycle. Because you don't know what you're going to love three years from now when you have to put your budget requests in now, today. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on that. Um, one of the things that we don't really think about because we've been living with the Department of Defense for over 70 years now is the radical nature of an administration that's actually done through a program-oriented budget as opposed to the traditional organizational and object. So the way a department used to run was you had a lot of uh, tech labs, you had in-house bureaus and technical services. They, they would have organic line items in the budget, right? Here's the Bureau of Ships. You get this amount of money. Now, the Bureau of Ships doesn't even have to fund ships necessarily. They actually had programmatic choice, and it was accountability after the fact. We check up on you because a budget is a forward-looking plan, right? So if you program a budget, it takes a lot of analysis. You have to lock down exactly what you want to do. And as Popper would say, you can't predict the growth of knowledge, right? Especially in the RDT and E appropriations. It might have made a lot of sense when we're doing reproducible goods in industrial manufacturing, but not necessarily for innovation. So if we had organizational budgets, again, you're not programming the future, you're saying, here's some money, do the best that you can with it, let's see what you get to test, and then I'm holding you accountable after the fact, and then I can make a centralized decision as to what should enter the force structure or not. Well, we've talked kind of a lot about more negative things, you know, times working against innovators in this space, funding, and the funding cycles are obviously working against them in this space. What are maybe some of the more solution-oriented um, programs coming out of DOD. I think, Linda, you have maybe something that you have exciting you want to announce at our conference uh, that is coming out tomorrow. I do. Tomorrow, we're um, planning on rolling out a, um, a solicitation. Um, check your FedBiz ops. Um, tomorrow, um, we are standing up a trusted capital marketplace. We are looking for a um, manager, essentially, that's what the, um, the OT is for tomorrow. Um, somebody who, or more than one, we can um, award multiple, uh, make multiple awards to um, create an ecosystem of trusted capital, VCs, 
uh, private equity, family offices, angel investors, um, running the gamut, um, who are trusted, who are using um, American money, who don't have LP limited partners, uh, foreign limited partners. Um, we're looking for American capital to um, be um, in an ecosystem with, uh, with, with tech, critical tech companies that the DOD has identified as um, working in one of the 10 um, or so areas. And these areas include autonomy and AI and robotics and 5G. The last panel talked, why isn't DOD doing more in 5G? We're doing 5G. Um, we, wanna, we, wanna, um, we want uh, US capital to invest in, um, in all these areas. These are critical areas, semiconductors, microelectronics. And um, this serves the dual purpose of ensuring these companies stay American um, and uh, supporting our supply chain and our defense industrial base. You know, this came out of um, our work in CFIUS. So the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, for those who are not in the middle of this, um, reviews foreign investments into U.S. businesses. And excuse me, and now after FIRMA and last year's NDA, um, it expanded to real estate. Uh, and non-controlling investments in certain technologies. And so we are, um, we, we see all these cases um, where our subject matter experts say, this tech is so cool and it is the best in the world. It cannot leave this country. We have to block that foreign investment. And at the same time, we've blocked their investment. So we really feel the need to ensure the stability of the, these critical technologies. Um, and while our funding um, is sometimes available, and, and we certainly are not withdrawing any of our funding, um, we, we would love to see this marketplace flourish as an alternative to a foreign investments. So this is really, um, this is so exciting. Um, um, leadership, Ms. Lord, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, thinks this is the best thing happening in the building. Um, and so with her leadership, we um, are standing this up tomorrow. So, so watch your FedBiz Ops. Awesome. So just a, a couple of comments about that. So um, uh, it, it really is interesting. Very, very interesting initiative. Um, I think it's to be praised in the sense that uh, in, one, in one way, for one reason, uh, it reflects that the department, um, sometimes the, the, the uh, federal agencies uh, tend not to be very introspective. Um, uh, the, 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 a legislation will be enacted, uh, they'll go about implementing it, and the, the, the unintended uh, consequences are, are, are what they are. This seems to me and uh, to, to me to be some sort of, uh, reflect some sort of tacit admission that, that uh, in terms of uh, that post firma CFIUS, the, uh, after uh, it has been amended uh, by recent reform legislation could very well result in um, a decreased number in uh, 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 transactions being approved. Uh, that is transactions uh, where an emerging technology startup uh, may seek uh, to try to get CFIUS approval of uh, a foreign, a foreign uh, investor. Um, this seems to suggest that, look, we understand that. We understand the, the, the value that these sorts of companies uh, provide to us and, and their need to be a, a really important part of our national security technology industrial base. And we're going to come up with a market-based solution to help them find domestic sources of investment. Uh, notably, it is not, doesn't appear to be the case based on the description that Linda provided where the DOD is going to be in the position of picking winners and losers, which is which is an important uh, distinction. Um, but certainly I'd like to hear more about it, how it rolls out, on what basis will the, the manager make these pairing decisions. Um, uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting, but it's nothing like, uh, nothing that I've heard of in a good long while, so it, it, very interesting. Yeah, I'll just note that it sounds like a, an interesting uh, operation. I would just think that as long as there's some kind of, not necessarily competition, but a, dip, a way that you have multiple organizations through which you do not get a type of group think as to one type of technology or one type of firm um, credentials is, is the correct one. So it's like, it's, it's that tug and pull. I think that you're opening yourself up to, which is which is important, and that we often kind of we would like to see 
okay, what is the top-down policy as opposed to how does the policy emerge from what we're seeing actually happen? So I should, remark, I should note that um, we expect this to be an iterative process. We don't expect that this is going to be the final, um, you know, sort of the ultimate. We expect that, um, and, um, and the and OT, prototype OT certainly lends itself to that. We are doing this under um, uh, both the prototype OT authority as well as seven, uh, Section 1711 of the NDAA for um, 2018. Um, and so... We are um, we are looking at this as a way to learn, and um, certainly we are looking for multiple solutions. So we're gonna we're gonna hope that we're gonna create a marketplace, an ecosystem that is not matching, but is gonna let capital meet with critical companies. So the manager is not gonna make decisions. The manager is gonna create an environment in which these you know, due diligence and these deals can be made. Do, do you have a sense of how those investment decisions or those decisions to invest in particular companies and the capabilities that they provide will align with the DOD's R&D priorities? Yeah, so we've, we're going to identify that there are 10 um, priority areas, as I, I mentioned some of them. Um, and so those are the priority areas that um, Dr. Griffin of R&D uh, R &E has outlined as the DOD priority areas. This is certainly um, intended to support our supply chain and our industrial base. So um, we also see the authority coming out of the... Um, um, the national, national defense strategy is encouraging public-private partnerships. And so um, this is really um, not just a whole of government, but as we see a whole of nation approach. We, you know, as we've heard, the China threat is, is real. It comes from the top down. It is strategic. It is organized. And we have to, we don't want to be China, but we have to look at this as a whole of nation, include private sector, and make, com, you know, have a complete public-private partnership on this. Last comment I'll make on that is if that could be complemented with some sort of uh, structure by which the DOD could engage in kind of the defense pondering, prospecting, and partnership decisions that tr CV uh, corporate venture capital firms traditionally make over a long-term time horizon, once again, to help ensure that these decisions, these investment decisions align with, once again, those intermediate, short to intermediate long-term R&D priorities vis-a-vis -vis emerging technology, it could be a powerful tool. We hope so. <laughs> and also, we're going to also be identifying critical companies, not just the managers. So we, we expect this will have a signaling effect to say these are companies we're really looking at. These are companies that we see are vulnerable. These are companies that are doing super cool tech. Um, and um, so we hope that encourages, that stimulates um, the private sector to um, look to invest. So along those lines, um, with this program, with other things, with what you said earlier with Secretary Carter using DIU as the mechanism to demystify DOD, particularly for Silicon Valley, I mean, do we think D DIU is actually working? Like that office, that innovation, the way that it is structured, is that the forward-looking way that the uh, DOD actually needs to go, or do we need to revisit something else? I, mean, I have to say, so, you know, they lost its X. I'm a little bit in mourning for the X. I liked that X. You got SpaceX. You got Google X. X is cool. Yeah, it is cool. But um, uh, Acting Secretary Shanahan thought removing the X showed that it wasn't experimental. It is here to stay. So it sh thought okay. it was a signaling a message that this was no longer um, something we're, we're we're, we're playing with. It's not. Um, it's certainly still iterative, okay. but um, um, they have um, more than a hundred prototype OTs. These are a hundred cool dual-use technologies that were initially built for the commercial sector. That have been um, that they have been um, working with um, warfighters to refine to ensure that the warfighters actually want to take this stuff. I mean, nothing is worse than having um, an 18-year-old who has been playing amazing video games get into the cockpit um, of an aircraft and find that the, um, you know, that the heads-up display is not as cool as the game, right? So I was in we a... We cannot have that. I mean, I we mean, need it to be cool for them. But cool, but effective, right? Effective, so, yes. Yeah. Cool. So, and, or some, or battery pack's too heavy. You're not going to take it down. 
you know, downrange with you. Um, so we will, so there is this great working relationship between the war fighters at DIU with with the companies. So they've have a, a, more than a hundred um, OTs, more than a hundred prototypes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think 13 have gone to production, and they expect that's to increase. So, and they just uh, a couple weeks ago they announced an 11 million dollar um, OT with um, small portable uh, UASs. Um, that Those are drones. Drones. Chris, you don't know that. Sorry, drones. Um, the warfighters can take into battlefield with them, and they can get you know full situational awareness. So we had one of these prototypes is about this big, and we showed it to senior leadership, and the question that was raised, and and you know super cool because, you know you got the operators hanging back, and they send this into the rooms of an adversary building, and um, the drone sends back video. And the senior leader said, well, what happens if they, they shoot that down? Well, sir, we know, A, they have weapons. A, there are people in there. B, they have weapons. And we just lost a $2,000 drone, not an operator's life. So, so, you know, the counter to the Googlers who don't want to work on Project Maven or other, or other um, uh, engineers out in the valley are, these are life-saving technologies. These are not killing technologies. These are life-saving technologies that DIU um, and others are bringing into the um, bringing to the warfighter into the DoD world. So, uh, DIU is definitely working. It is highly successful, um, and they have a new authority um, that is not yet ready for prime time, but they have a new authority from this year's NDA, Section 203. I know you're all checking your <laughs> your copies of the uh, John McCain uh, NDAA. But um, it is um, to create a, a National Security Innov um, Innovation Capital Fund, NSIC, to fund hardware. Because as we know, if you have a dog walking app, you get funding, <laughs> funding as much as you want. Um, hardware, obviously, it takes more money, um, has a slower exit, and is riskier. And um, companies like, we're at AT&T, right? So companies like Bell Labs used to invest in these things. And even they want quicker exits and, um, and less risk adverse. And so we're seeing, we see a real problem on funding hardware. And so um, this NSIC authority that's going to be housed at DIU is, um, has been created to, um, to, work with, to, to, um, to work to counter that. So DIU as well is alive and well. Pablo? Um, so I, I also agree DIU has been uh, tremendously successful, in my view, for educating the military departments on how to fish. In, in edu educating them in the value of using rapid acquisition authorities and alternative acquisition pathways to procure immer uh, unproven uh, commercially uh, developed technology. That having been said, my view is also that the most significant indication of DIU success will ultimately be when it's no longer necessary because the preponderance of that, the, the center of gravity of that, those purchase decisions have migrated to the military departments themselves. Um, that having been said, before that can happen, a lot of the, some of the uh, systemic impediments that we talked about a few minute, a minutes ago will have to be effectively overcome. But, but for now, I think I, I completely agree that the track record uh, is excellent. I also, once again, uh, 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 lauded in the same way that I have the, 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 the initiative that Linda uh, described just a moment ago, uh, rolled out a moment ago in terms of how it reflects out-of-the-box market-based thinking, which is a fundamental deviation from, from how a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways the government thinks about solving problems like this. So uh, there's a, a, a lot there to like, but I think we've got a long way to go. Yeah, uh, I tend to agree. I, I haven't been living in the DIU world, but from my outsider's perspective, it seems that they've done a lot of good jobs trying to transition technology, but um, again, funding is one of the issues that I, I'm, I'm broken record here. Uh, you know, DIU kind of had its own budget kind of that Congress would annually kind of approve. It tended to be in the tens of, tens of millions is my understanding. Um, but you know, you can only do so much with that. And where they seem to have been going over the past few years was, hey, you know, funding for us is a problem, but we've created these great solutions to kind of get commercial companies, the new entrants on board. 
Uh, so they were trying to work with a lot of the services. You guys have money and requirements. We have ways that we can help you get there. And I think that was kind of part of what Pablo was talking about. Eventually, you might be able to transition a lot of that, that out of DIU. But again, um, I think the funding and the scaling is an issue because, again, with, with the big hardware items, it's not necessarily going to be the case that you're going to want to just say, I'm going to go for a fully integrated state-of-the-art sixth generation fighter or something. You might want to be able to, for example, build out fully workable subsystems and then decide to integrate something rapidly later. But you know, since 1976, I believe, with uh, OMB Circular A109, they basically said, you're not really allowed to do any subsystem prototyping unless you've identified a major uh, system end item and requirement. So that that whole sect, that whole area of, of kind of getting to the big platforms seems a little bit shaky right now due to due to the funding, but also due to uh, inability to kind of do subsystem prototyping independent of platform considerations at that stage. So we've talked about the fact that, you know, the long stretches of time, an impediment, funding, an impediment, but we're also coming up with solutions. DOD is actually trying to uh, address these, but that's just kind of one piece of the puzzle of how we continue to maximize our innovation efforts in the defense space. And you touched on this briefly earlier, Linda, about people who work maybe at Google Maven don't necessarily want to work on defense projects because they see everything is, everything is just to kill p other people, kill our enemies. And we all know, I think in this room, I hope at least that DOD does so much more than just build weapons. Uh, where do we think that we can all build a bridge between the defense industry and the tech industry, particularly out in California, build that bridge to where we're at common ground? I know we worked hard with DIU demystifying like, who DOD is, but you know, what's the next step of actually making people go, oh, I get it now? Well, I love the programs that allow um, engineers to come into DOD and then go back out. Um, these are some of these ideas that have been talked about that um, you have um, you have a defense specialty or you're an engineer in DOD and then you can go out in the private sector and work and then you come back and that you know it's so much um, that we find that um, military and DOD is very sort of isolated and stovepiped and you know around here it's, it's there's a lot of DOD and in certain places around the country but out in Silicon Valley, there's not a lot of DOD. When I was living out there on a DOD salary, really I should say. It's really kind of funny. I mean, if you think about how Silicon Valley started. Well, so. uh, no, 100%. And, you know, these guys, they like their GPS. They like their internet. Well, where did that come from? Right? I don't so, know. and, you know, HP, like they all came from DOD contacts. They did. They did. So, but, um, you know, being a DOD person out in the valley, um, as I said, on a DOD salary was a little challenging. Should we um, red letter them so everyone's warned, like they work at DOD? <laughs> you know? That kind of thing? No, but I was in a unicorn. Everyone was sort of so curious. Like, what does it mean you work for DOD? Like, they don't know anybody. And I think a mixing of the cultures, more Silicon Valley working um, in sort of the defense world and defense um, engineers going out um, into um, the civilian ecosystem. I think I think that probably would go a long way to demystifying and uh, making people less cons less fearful of working um, with, uh, with the Pentagon. Yeah. I mean, Pablo, you've worked in this space a long time, too. I mean, from your time in the Senate of actually, like, making sure that there is money to buy this technology um, to the companies. I mean, you represent and, and your firm represent a, you know, a lot of the blue chip major players in this space. Great. We have an idea of bringing people from Silicon Valley and putting them in the Pentagon for a year, but how can we come from the Pentagon and go out there? Um, lots of different ways I, to, I could answer the, that, that question. Um, one of them I think might be to kind of take issue with the, just a predicate in your question, and that is um, the, uh, the, there, the, there are lots of emerging technology ecosystems out there other than Silicon Valley. Um, the, you know, Seattle, um, Riley Durham, Orlando, Austin, Boston. Um, uh, uh, I would describe uh, the, 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 the metro uh, Phoenix area. A lot of emerging technology ecosystems at various levels of maturity, and within them, there are tons of people that are very interested in working, commercial uh, developers, that are very interested in doing business with the DOD. Why? Because it makes business sense. Because particularly that's at that scale in terms of dollar amounts, the DOD pays early. 
and these companies are doing business by the DOD and being, a, a, being in a position where the DOD pays early can extract a significant cash flow advantage associated with the timing of those payments and can reinvest that in R&D or, 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 or what have you. So from a business decision standpoint, they a lot of them want to do business with the DOD. In, in markets like Silicon Valley, my own view is that the, 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 the competition for highly skilled technical labor is so much so that particularly among the larger companies, most notably Google, but you know, to, uh, you, we, there was also a skirmish along these lines with Microsoft, um, that uh, management has really almost no choice but to, 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 to pay attention to when their employees assert themselves along these lines. How indicative that is of, of, of similarly, uh, of, of employees of a, of a similar profile in the scores of other emerging technology ecosystems around the country, I'm not sure that it is necessarily. But that having been said, um, uh, one of the, I think, the, 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 big, the, the big things that the DOD, um, I think, can always be, be, be better at, m most broadly, is, once again, kind of the, the broad theme of, of doing business with the commercial sector. Uh, Pesha, you talked about the larger companies. Uh, come the DOD has no no problem working with the prime contractors. Uh, they've developed a relationship over a long period of time that uh, has resulted in these prime contractors developing uh, a good amount of expertise in precisely how to do business with the DOD. And that has resulted in, in, among other things, they're taking on layers of overhead in terms of cost accounting systems and layers of overhead that actually enable them to do business with the DOD. In my view, that uh, uh, the net uh, uh, level of technological innovation has suffered, but they've developed expertise in, once again, in, in, in doing business with the DOD. A far greater interest to me personally is the smaller companies, which comprise a very, very important part of the national security security technology industrial base. I think the DOD can always be better at doing business, demystif dis demystifying itself. Um, uh, uh, there are scores of actually commercial item procurement reforms that were legislated, I think it was in the 2016 uh, uh, defense authorization bill for which rulemaking has yet to begin. You know, focus on that. Um, but uh, uh, once again, doing those things that can make it, uh, that can demystify itself to the commercial sector most broadly, I think would probably be the single most important uh, thing that the DoD could do. Yeah, I would just reiterate there, a lot of the regulations, especially when you start scaling, I get a contract of $50 million, right? Now I have to have an audible cost accounting system. I have to go and do what's called earned value management, which is this linear uh, planning of the entirety of the effort and then how that rolls up into all the costs so that I can track performance rather than it's the exact opposite of what you would think of as iterative and agile, right? But this is a requirement for all these large contracts. They're talking about whether you can get rid of that for software now. And then the, the list just goes on and on, rates and price negotiations, all the DCA auditors, and then um, a lot of your tests and evaluation master plans. Are, a lot of these small companies don't really know how to pull all that stuff together. So that's one big thing. And it's like that's going to be a huge barrier. Um, you know, we've seen actually commercial item procurements have actually been going down. That was something that the Section 809 committee was, was kind of harping on there, which is, which kind of makes sense from that perspective of, well, if I need a big contract and I still have to go through all these rules and regulations, and I still have to line up my money two years ahead of time, right? You're, you're going to get into a situation. The other thing I would say there that would actually, this, this almost sounds like it would be going back against, um, you know, it's almost, a lot of people would think that this might be against uh, industry and defense coming together, but I see a larger technical in-house staff as critical to the government being a good buyer. Say now, it one more time. <laughs> a large in-house technical staff is critical for a smart buyer because what we've tried to do over the 1950s was say, I want to divest all of my technical talent and go to a lead systems integrator, one single prime contractor, and I just need enough evaluation talent just to say, oh, I know what you're going to do, and that's the right technical approach. But in these complicated innovation kinds of uh, situations, you can't know that, right? You have to have some kind of development or production or strong in-house technical knowledge like naval reactors that was built up under Rickover in order to secure you know, the kind of authority and accountability and technical knowledge that breeds trust. And then when 
decision makers and policy leaders trust these uh, these these uh, in-house uh, persons with high technical excellence, then you can kind of see that a lot of these issues might be going away where you can kind of transact on a more commercial basis. A lot of, there's a lot of less alleviation. You don't have program managers and contract officers rotating in and out every year or two uh, so that they can make their flag rank because that's what they needed. They actually have, they're there. They have some kind of permanent assignment. They have strong technical knowledge. They're able to uh, negotiate and not fall back on these well, what's your acquisition plan? Outline exactly everything you're going to do. We're going to hold you to that specification when, again, that specification might not be in the government's best interest when we learn more information along the way. Okay. We have barely even scratched the surface. I realize that on everything, but we've kind of talked a lot about, you know, funding, timelines. Now we want to try to uh, bridge the cultural gap, but I know there's got to be some people in the room that might want to ask a question or two while we have these three folks on stage, and I want to make sure we have enough time for them to maybe give some closing remarks. Or we can keep going other. Oh, you had a question. Our Phil Donahue is going to get some exercise today. Uh, this is a question for Linda. Um, do you view biotech as an important DOD priority? And if so, um, what is DOD doing to improve biotech innovation? So, thank you for that question. Biotech is not has not been identified as one of our ten key areas. Um, I can guess maybe there's a sense that there is um, sufficient investment out there, both um, in in the corporate America, and um, but um, that would just be a guess. I don't know why it's not one of our key areas because certainly um, we are concerned about biotech, but um, actually DoD is concerned about everything really. But I don't know, Pablo. Do you have a Good answer for that. Well, I, I think you're, you're, you're right, Linda. I, I think the areas that have been identified as R&D priorities are those that the DOD has recognized that require more support, that these are dual-use dual technologies that where the, market, where, where the market is today may not sufficiently fund or support the DOD, what the, the DOD's needs in, in that regard. Biotech is obviously a very, very robust sector, the commercial sector, um, query whether or not it needs that kind of support. Support. Um, once again, the kind of the areas that the DOD has recognized to date are those, you know, so let's do some deals with emerging tech uh, 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 startups or other venture back com uh, uh, venture back companies that are that are developing the, the, these uh, the, these technologies in a manner that's conducive to attract outside private investment, and then we will serve as and otherwise harvest and service the unintended beneficiary of the development of these in the commercial. So. You can see that in hypersonics. You can see that in obviously AI, machine learning in particular. You can see that in other areas. I'm not sure that you necessarily need to say the same thing about bi biotech per se. I have to say, I think there are labs, DoD labs that um, fund biotech. I do think it's not it's not an R and E area. It's not an A and S issue, um, acquisition area. But um, I do think elements of DoD are investing, and of course the U.S. government. Um, and as that, you know, there's plenty of biotech investment um, throughout the, the government. But I do think that there are in, um, there are uh, investments and in grants made through through by DoD else in other parts. Anyone else? Oh, yep. good thing he has long legs, huh? Hi, uh, you guys have done an awesome job of explaining sort of uh, some of the advancements you've made in breaking down the funding, traditional funding barriers and the conversation between startups and the DOD. I've had the opportunity to work for two firms now that also try to help broker the conversation between the Valley and the government. And another source of friction that we see over and over is the lengthy, uh, specific to software, is the lengthy accreditation timeline for getting into DOD networks. So I was just curious if there have been any similar advancements on the security side for continuing to broker this conversation. Ooh. Anyone want to try to tackle that? No, the only, I, I think that remains an issue. I, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I'm unaware of relaxations and certification requirements uh, associated with the DOD's procurement of, 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 of software. Um, um, along that have been nearly as aggressive as some of the other reforms that we've seen in other areas. 
Um, I don't know if we want to relax them. But that's the thing. I that's think with thing. foreign adversaries getting into our um, into all kinds of um, systems, I don't know that that's an objective. Yeah, I think you're with the the joint enterprise uh, defense infrastructure, the Jedi uh, cloud computing contractor. You're starting to see kind of like how they're a little bit trying to make this modular. How can we kind of integrate a lot of these different, and it kind of goes back and forth. Is Jedi going to be 100% of the cloud, 10% of the cloud? It, it, it kind of seems to be varying there. But, um, you know, the Fed, the Fed ramp uh, regulations are just tens of thousands of pages there of rules and regulations to get plugged into that network. And it, it's, it, as, as Linda said, you know, you can't just like willy nilly have, have a lot of, uh, of leaks and, and ways to get into that network. But you also want to be able to um, get some of these guys in, so you're kind of in a in a little a hard place there. Okay, we have time for one more question. If anyone has a last question, oh, I don't see hands. I'll ask a question. Got the microphone. So, so, a absolutely, I'll take the prerogative. So uh, it seems like I hear about some type of new initiative by DoD to bridge the divide with the tech industry almost on a monthly basis. Uh, you announce one that will go live tomorrow. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, and with a $700 billion budget, you know, the DOD has the most capacity of anyone in government to do something. Uh, but, you know, sometimes less is more. Uh, is there anyone playing air traffic controller to try and make sure there's not redundancies, there's not, you know, just duplicative work um, being done by these various efforts uh, across all of DOD as it relates to trying to engage the tech industry, either Pablo, you know, getting at smaller companies or getting at investors um, or, or whatever the outcome might be. Uh, can I tackle that real quick? So the Department of Defense has been set up specifically to do exactly what you just said, identify and remove redundancy or, du or duplication of programs. That is almost the entire review process is to ensure that what exactly what you just said there. So there's many offices. OSD Cape is one of them, kind of at the top there, that kind of has like the final say on the programmatics. But um, I think what Armin Alchin, who's probably the greatest economist who didn't of the 20th century that didn't really get a Nobel Prize, what he said about this when he worked at Rand working on weapon systems acquisition, he basically said, if the sure sign of an insufficient uh, R&D program is the lack of duplication and uh, of programs that some kind of person can come in and say, well, look at all this waste. But it's not wasteful when you have different programs taking different approaches to solve a, diff a, a problem. So it's that competition and it's that diversity in research and development which provides insurance for the production decision so that you're not stuck with for example, an F-35. Now, we can debate the merits of the program, but the fact of the matter is it's in development for over 20 years, and they basically stamped out any other kind of competitor. So, so the competition in the R&D side and the ability for someone outsider to come in and say, look, that was wasteful, it's almost a precondition to having a successful R&D program. Well, I would answer that's a great question. Um, the in terms of how the DoD interacts with commercial technology innovators, particularly smaller ones that are such an important part of our national security technology and uh, industrial base, I'm unaware of that kind of uh, functional uh, capability. Um, I privately called for something that I would call a national security technology accelerator network. You know, where you could have maybe the Undersecretary of Defense for R and E up top working with DIU or MD5 interact acting, let's say, as a pilot with the top 10 research universities that serve as the linchpins for the top 10 or so emerging technology uh, 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 ecosystems around the country that could provide R&E, i.e. DOD, with a landscape perspective of the state of the industry uh, and ultimately, what you know, where in what areas do companies need to be seeded so that they can develop emerging technologies that align with our strategic pri R&D priorities? That kind of it's a CVC. It's a perspective that a commercial venture capital firm would take. So it, to, to inform once again, it's R and it's it's technology uh, 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 pondering, prospecting, and partnering decisions over a one to ten year time horizon. That's the kind of capability, in my view, that the DoD needs. 
needs. Um, I, I'm unaware of anything like that today. Okay, sorry. I'm not going to let you answer that because we're almost finished, and I want everyone to have an opportunity to say the one thing that you want everyone here, if they remember one thing about this panel, what would that be, Linda? Well, um, just to answer that quickly is I think you throw everything Good. at the wall. I think you throw everything at the wall and try, and that's my last word, like is that, you know, Secretary Mattis said, used to say um, we, he never wanted a fair fight. He always want overwhelming superiority. And in this context, it's tech. We want to be the best in every area. We don't, we don't want to deal with a competitor on the battlefield who um, has better AI, who has better 5G, has better robotics. We, um, we need, this is a whole of nation fight. We need, to, we need to be in the fight with all of you. And um, we look forward to the engagement. I guess the quick observation that I would make is, uh, and I've been covering defense acquisition policy and contracting issues for, for, for quite a long while. Um, there are lots of issues, a lot of impediments, but what I've been seeing in the DOD, particularly over the last three to five years, um, has been unlike anything that I've ever seen before. In terms of the receptivity that the DOD has in engaging or trying to engage with commercial technology innovators. So, you know, the, uh, the mysticism, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it is misplaced. The, uh, oh, any skepticism about the willingness of the DOD to do business with the commercial innovators should no longer be there. Lots of issues need to be attended to, but I really have seen a sea change in the DOD's recognition that it needs to interact with commercial innovators to maintain technological dominance worldwide vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis, uh, uh, future adversaries and a willingness in part as reflected by the, by the initiative that Linda rolled out just a few minutes ago as well as other areas, a willingness to want to do business with the DOD. So I think that's the, the big thing I would say. I would say that the Department of Defense after World War II was set up uh, in an industrial era mindset of repetitive manufacturing and tangible objects as opposed to intangible investments in platform design, in company uh, business processes, and, and, uh, and other types of and software, for example, that's an intangible asset. Um, so I would say that uh, the, f the single biggest aspect um, to kind of reforming the Department of Defense is to relook at the planning programming uh, budgeting system and say, is this, this thing that was designed with Soviet era um, thoughts and rational management planning in mind, is this really the kind of system that we need for Department of Defense, potentially for the operating and support and the, uh, the production decisions, but especially in R&D where you can't know what it is that you're going to be doing until you get to tests, right? It's imperative that we, we maintain diversity, a tolerance for diversity, and a tolerance for, uh, for new programs to start, be quick, show what you can do, get it to test before saying the, before letting the bureaucracy essentially come down on it. Thank you all very much.